Hello, my name is Janet and I'm publisher with Elsevier. Medicine Journal is a collection of current reviews for internal medicine training exam revision and continuing professional development. This year, medicine celebrates its 50th anniversary. In honour of this, we've put together a collection of podcasts recorded by the journal's chairman, Albert Farrow. We hope you enjoy them. If you want to find out more about medicine, including how to subscribe, please visit www.medicinejournal.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the uh, Medicine Podcast. Uh, My name is Albert Farrow. I'm a clinical pharmacologist at KCL and I'm the editor-in-chief of the journal Medicine. And I'm delighted to have with me uh, today uh, Professor George Griffin, uh, who's an emeritus professor of infectious disease and medicine uh, at St George's. Uh, I'll let him expand on his on his biography a little bit in a moment. But very very warm welcome to you, George. Very nice to be here, Albert. Thank you for asking me. Delighted. So, as I said, uh, it would be very uh, useful to have a brief outline of yourself, who you are, and your career. I think your career has been quite unconventional, and I think we'd be very interested to hear about it. Well, in, indeed it has, and uh, I, I hope uh, uh, people who are listening see that uh, I've been led by the flow and uh, and been very fortunate in having fantastic mentors and teachers that have, have helped me along. But uh, I, I hope that's what evolves during the talk. Um, how did I start medicine? Well, that's... Very interesting. I I was brought up in East Yorkshire in Hull and went to a a co-ed grammar school. Had a wonderful biology teacher, Eva Crackles was her name, and she was not very good for exam teaching, but she was fabulous for stimulating. And she would take us out and rock pooling and looking at bogs for uh, rare plants and so on. And, And that started to make me curious. And that is a word that I think you'll see comes up several times. I, I've developed a, a, a curiosity. Uh, and I think in medicine and in research, you have to be curious. You're searching for things. So the real thing that started me wanting to do medicine, because my, my family wasn't medical, was watching uh, on a black and white television a program called Your Life in Their Hands. Oh, yes, I remember was, that program. This was from Hammersmith Hospital. Uh, very, very patrician consultant uh, in casualty uh, explaining what was happening in casualty. And I was absolutely fascinated by this, absolutely fascinated. And I decided medicine is the thing for me. And I was 15 at the time. And I got a little booklet called Becoming a Doctor from uh, 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 the BMA. Now, in those days, uh, the London medical schools, uh, you, you applied in the lower sixth. So you were only 16. And you applied. This was the year before uh, UCCA, now called UCAS, came in. So there were no computers. You had forms to fill in. And I... I used this little booklet, got all the addresses, wrote off to the deans and got lots of forms back. And in those days, there were 12 medical schools in London. The first one that came back, St. George's, this was uh, December. And I was going to school on the bus. The bus knocked a lollipop man down. And I ran downstairs holding this form and the form dropped in a puddle as I was trying to help this poor man who'd obviously broken his leg. So I I tried to get this form cleaned up and just about managed it. And then when I got home, I ironed it out. And I thought, crikey, do I send this in? And I did do. And by return, I got an interview. Now, in those days, this was the dean and the secretary. It wasn't a whole load of different people uh, and you went from desk to desk. It was 20 minutes with the Dean and Secretary. And at the end of this pretty conventional interview, he said, Griffin, uh, what's this on your form? And I explained what had happened, that I'd stopped and helped this 
this poor man because he broke his leg. And the dean, uh, the, then Alistair Hunter, looked at the secretary and smiled and looked back at me and said, uh, uh, George, I think you're just the sort of person I want in my medical school. Would three E's be all right? <laughs> now imagine, what, a, what an offer. Imagine. Well, I yes. don't that I'm pleased to say. But imagine if that happened these days with the regimented, everybody has the same question and, and so on. Mm. So I started off in the lower sixth, uh, having a place in a London medical school and started doing medicine. And I was at King's College London to start with. And I absolutely loved it, even anatomy, uh, which a lot of my colleagues just couldn't stand. I thought was really interesting. And I remember then my curiosity, uh, when we were dissecting the arm, I said to the demonstrator, isn't it amazing? All these muscles and they're all innovated in a different way. So you can move your fingers so precisely. And he just said, oh, for goodness sake, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a, he's now an ENT surgeon, I must tell you. <laughs> but he was very good. Uh, at what he was doing, but it, it was purely pedantic. But uh, I did well at second MB, then did a degree in a BSc degree in pharmacology, got the prize at King's, and then started on clinical work. But en route, I decided I would do a PhD because I was so fascinated by the science, even though I knew I wanted to be a clinical doctor. And that, that was my long-term aim. And I did a PhD, finished that, and then went on to clinical medicine. And, and the dean of St. George's, who was the same chap, realized that uh, this chap is perhaps a bit different and we are going to help him. Uh, and so he let me do the BSc, uh, the PhD, and then come to do clinical medicine. And then clinical medicine at George's was pretty old-fashioned in those days. There were firms, uh, there were long attachments in obstetrics and gynecology, which I, I actually enjoyed. And there was nothing about clinical medicine in my degree that I didn't find exciting and stimulating. And then I passed my medical finals, so I got a BSc, a PhD, and then MBBS. And I became house surgeon to the professor of medicine. And this is how I was saying earlier on, follow the flow. The boss that I had, John Jenkins, was an endocrinologist. And I thought that was what I was going to do. And halfway through this job, uh, the professor who'd helped me get the PhD said, George, uh, I was a Harkness fellow. And I think you ought to apply for one. And I said, well, it's not the right time. He said, look, just go for it because they're very prestigious and they will help you in your career. So I applied, had a very, very uh, long and tense interview and got a Harkness Fellowship and went to the Department of Physiology in Harvard Medical School uh, and had a great year and three quarters there. Now, this, it turns out, was between house jobs. Now, imagine what the GMC said about that. Ooh, nobody's I ever presume done. they thought that was very unconventional. Oh, nobody's done this. Does, does that mean you don't want to be a doctor? And I said, no, of course. I really want to be a doctor. But I, I've got this fantastic opportunity. Please let me do it. In the end, they did. So when I'd finished at uh, Harvard, I came back to a house surgeon's job at Ashford District General Hospital in order to get registered. And this was with a wonderful consultant called Robin Burkett, the uh, brother of the uh, Burkett of Burkett lymphoma. One in two, first on, no registrar in the hospital. And that's when I really learned clinical medicine. And I saw every acute abdomen and had to bring the boss in for that. And that really was 
uh, one of the, the most interesting jobs I've done, even though I knew I wanted to be an academic physician. Then I got on the academic medicine route and went to the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, Hammersmith Hospital for SHO jobs, and then to Queen Square. And by then, following the flow, I thought, oh, neurology is very interesting. I, I could do that. But I just didn't like Queen Square. And I thought, George, follow the flow. And they invited me back to Hammersmith to be a registrar before I had the membership, actually, uh, to be a registrar in gastroenterology. And th this was with Chris Boo uh, and Vin Chadwick, wonderful teachers, and I really enjoyed that. Then, after two and a half years, it was clear to me that endoscopy was the route in gastroenterology, and, and I, I was much more biochemical than that. And I got a telephone call from Peter Richards at St. George's saying St. George's was expanding. It was becoming separated from King's with its own preclinical science. And the academic board wanted to invite me back as a lecturer. And this was too good to be true. And I decided I would go back to St. George's, much to the chagrin of. Uh, uh, Chris Booth and Keith Peters at uh, Hammersmith. But as you'll see, it worked out. At that time, I'd always been interested in infection. But of course, it was a very small, or it was in those days, a very small discipline. But St. George's had been the regional infection unit. And there was the most wonderful clinician there called Harold Lambert. And he became my mentor and a real father figure in infectious diseases. And I became his senior registrar lecturer. And I then thought, well, how can I do this in infection? I'm not a microbiologist. And then the penny dropped. Why don't you look at the metabolic and immunological effects of infection? Why do people lose weight when they have tuberculosis? What is their immune response and how can you help uh, potentiate that? Uh, antimicrobial resistance was just becoming important then, and that, of course, is very biochemical. And at that point, I managed to get a welcome senior lectureship and did that for uh, six years and then was taken uh, and then was on the staff as an honorary senior lecturer, honorary consultant and then became an a honorary consultant and eventually professor of infectious diseases and medicine. So, Albert, you were quite right. <laughs> An unconventional career. Very, uh, very different, uh, isn't it, to how uh, trainees would, would be expected to progress today. Oh, uh, it is indeed. And I, I feel sad about that in some ways because I, I can't believe out there there, there aren't people who, like me, are absolutely keen to do clinical medicine at the highest level, but mm. they're curious. They want to mm. know how things work and how you can make things work better. And, yeah. and I've been very, very fortunate having fantastic teachers and mentors all the way through. So, yeah, unconventional. It's <laughs> it's it's a fantastic story. Thank you, George. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned that, that your your route into clinical academia, and I'm interested in your views as to whether uh, maybe uh, these days it might be harder to become a clinical academic than it was in in your day and my day, for that matter. Uh, what do you think? I mean, clearly, there's a lot of um, budding doctors who are very interested in research and want an mm. academic career, but. It's not so straightforward these days. What do you think comparing when you did it with how things are now? Well, I, I'd agree with your comment. It's not so straightforward these days. I mean, I, I was very fortunate in that I had very good mentors and clinical teachers uh, at postgraduate level. And the restrictions for um, uh, getting up the ladder were much simpler simpler than, than they are now. 
uh, the only ladder was having MRCP. Mm. And that was it. And when you got that, you, you were then on a senior registrar level. Uh, there was nothing in the way of appraisals. Uh, the postgraduate deans you could talk to and say, look, I'd like to do this. Is that all right? And they would say, yes. Now, there's a rigid, rigid system, which in my view is is too rigid. And, and it certainly doesn't help academic uh, doctors. I think getting a really good mentor who spots you as being good and wanting to do it. Uh, and there's no distinction in my uh, mind between excellent clinical medicine and excellent academic research. It, it's just a continuum. And, yeah. and I've been, it's, all part, it's all part of the same spectrum. Same thing. And I, I've been very fortunate to be able to move uh, eloquently between those two ends of the spectrum. Indeed, indeed. George, one of the uh, reasons I invited you on is because you, you're a very long-standing editorial board member on, on the yes. journal of medicine. In fact, I think you're the longest uh, uh, serving indeed. editorial board member. And I think your, your history with it goes back even further, uh, back to your MBBS days. Would you like to tell us about your experience of the journal back it then and, and now? It does indeed, Albert. I use medicine uh, as uh, uh, a learning aid when I was doing my uh, medical degree. And I don't know whether it was the first edition or the second one, but it was one with a, an orange cover. And I still have them upstairs, actually. I and think it was called Medicine International in those days. I remember was, the orange cover. Yeah. And yes. it was absolutely fabulous to have that. And you'll see later on how proud I was to be invited on the editorial board and help make sure it advanced and kept going because I think it's a real help to medical students and postgraduates. And one of the things when I got on the editorial board, the idea was this is really a postgraduate aid and aimed for membership. In fact, uh, and it may just have been me, I, I found it fantastically helpful at, at degree, first degree level for all sorts of, of, of reasons. Do you think it's as relevant today as it was back then, uh, given that we're, we live in a, uh, an information age, the fact that you know uh, information is so much more easily available on the internet uh, and on trusted medical sites and so forth, as well as other textbooks. Do you think the journal still has a place in, in medical education? Oh, very much. One of the important reasons is quite simply that it is renewed by often young consultants, senior lecturers. So all the time it's being upgraded and all the time the editorial board are thinking of of new things and important new new changes in uh, in medicine, and so it's contemporary. The other thing is, it's very easy to pick up a copy or to use your iPad or, or whatever your computer you're using, just to look up something. If you've got a spare half an hour, quarter of an hour, if you're travelling. Uh, and it's, uh, I just think it's still got great value. Textbooks now are very expensive and they date. And if you want to keep up to date, you've got to buy new one. And that's one of the beauties of, uh, of, of, of medicine. I, I used to edit and did, I think, for maybe three editions, the infection uh, part. Uh, infection immunity, and then uh, it developed when HIV came along, and we, we split that off. Um, and it was moving on all the time, and that, that was something I found very, very important about the journey. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's probably uh, right. And as an example, I guess we uh, very topical at the moment is COVID, and that's something that won't appear in the textbooks for quite some time because of mm. the lag period that's involved in textbooks being written then published so um so i guess that is uh, something about the journal that it's it it, it does have a, a great topicality um speaking of covid what has your experience been of it in terms of how it affected your work 
um, and just your general thoughts about lessons to be learned from the pandemic. Well, I, I mean, it's it's amazing when you think what has been happening even in the past five years. We've had the COVID, epi, well, epidemic, pandemic, and now we're hoping it's it's slipping away, but we don't know. We've had huge advances in very rapid advances in in vaccines, and we're still not there yet with vaccines for COVID, as it were, which will prevent disease. We know it. There's an amelioration of of the severe disease, um, but uh, we, we've learned an, an awful lot about vaccines. We've learned an awful lot about the uh, immune system uh, in response to these infections. One of the amazing things. That, that I think about it is this is SARS-2. There was SARS-1, the same coronavirus group of uh, infections. And I, I remember I was in the States at the time doing some lectures, and this was really hot news. And they were desperate because there was nothing they knew about it. They knew coronaviruses caused the common cold, of course, but this SARS-1 was very different. and. Uh, what they did was they locked down in Hong Kong and in Toronto in two big hospitals. They simply locked the doors. Nobody could come in. Nobody could go out. And that, that was the old infection method, of course, cordon sanitaire, uh, to actually try to restrict infections. And we were very, very lucky. It didn't take off. SARS-2, uh, COVID, has been a much, much more uh, difficult thing, of course, and, and became pandemic. Took rather a long time for the WHO to uh, recognize it was pandemic. And of course, it's still rampant in, in China at the moment. We're beginning to understand about long COVID. And uh, I, I do think this does exist and, and we will be probing the uh, immune aspects of that. Now, the, the other thing I've been involved in uh, since I became emeritus has been uh, policy for medicine. And I became uh, a member of the Academy of Medical Sciences and then a vice president, and then uh, became president of the European Academy of uh, the Federation of the European Academies of Medicine. And that was very, well, is still very, very interesting because it one of the things it did was to make medical policy for the EU. And at the moment, uh, we are looking at uh, a project uh, through a, a group called Periscope on pandemic preparedness, how to be ready for the next uh, infectious episode, which comes along. Mm. Monkeypox, who was yeah. expecting monkeypox to come along at the same time as we're hopefully seeing the end of, uh, uh, of, um, of COVID? Uh, what's going to happen if syphilis becomes uh, even more prevalent uh, and becomes resistant to antibiotics? So. Epidemics and pandemics will always be around, but the idea now is to have everything ready mm. with good surveillance, with good communication, and then to have good response and response avenues ready for that. So things have changed mm. uh, and are changing all the time, Albert. And, you know, th that's one of the things of medicine which... Uh, I uh, I really appreciate, and is part of this thing as well. I was saying about the medicine journal, um, medicine changes, and and it has to be seen to be changing. Absolutely, I think your career so far has has, has uh, demonstrated the sort of things that are possible in in a in a in a very good medical career uh, as you've had, um, and I want to just sort of finish with your thoughts about whether you would still recommend medicine as a career to somebody at school who's interested in a possible career as a doctor. Do you think it's something uh, you would still recommend people to go into? 
despite the well-publicised woes of the NHS? Yes, without the slightest doubt. Uh, I can give you another anecdote just before I answer your question properly. When I was at uh, King's doing second MD, there were tough exams at the end of every term for five terms. And then you sat, as you probably remember, Albert, your your, your second uh, MD uh, ready to go into clinical. Well, you did the exams, you went on vacation and you came back. And when you came back, you looked on the board to see your exam results. And there were two things that happened to me then. The first was that sometimes I was top of the year of 120. The next time I was bottom of the year of 120. And I just couldn't understand it. And you will remember this was a do or die exam. You, mm. you had to pass it. You had another chance. But that was it. And I went to see the sub-dean before this second MB exam, and I said, Dr. Charles, I can't understand this. How can I be the top sometimes and the bottom the next time? I really want to be a, med- a doctor, and I like what I'm doing, and I'm working hard. And he said, oh, Griffin, I'll get your exam papers. Unfortunately, he kept them. Mm-hmm. And I went two weeks later, and he threw this paper across the table. I can remember this so distinctly. And he said, is there any wonder you're bottom of the year? And I looked at this paper. I said, Dr. Charles, this isn't my handwriting. And it turned out there were two Griffins in the year. There was me and another Griffin. I won't say his name for obvious reasons. And all the way through for two years, they'd been switching our exam papers. Goodness. <laughs> oh, dear. So I, I learned What a mistake to make. But what I did know was that the other Griffin was from a medical family, and he'd been pushed into medicine and really yeah. didn't want to do it. Yes. And so starting now to answer your question properly, you've got to have a desire to do medicine and be excited by it, uh, be curious about it, and, and, and want to really look forward to being a doctor. Now, people say, oh, it's such a long, hard graft. Well, every profession is. Look at the law. We produce too many law graduates. There aren't enough jobs. Look at architecture, an even longer degree course than than medicine, still not enough jobs. With a medical degree, you are entering a very privileged professional life where you can do things from uh, laboratory uh, work entirely through to high-level clinical work, through to surgery, through to radiology. It is like a GCSE, in my views. It's opening the pathway to many, many wonderful careers. Mm-hmm. So my answer would, to your question is it's, it's a great privilege to do it. And uh, I, I have no regrets whatsoever. So be curious, follow the flow, and find a mentor. That's a very good place to end. George Griffin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Albert.